Hildreth Meyer was one of the most influential and creative decorative artists of the 20th century. Her spectacular creations adorn public and private buildings throughout New York and elsewhere. You know her work, although you probably do not know her name. Her specialty was the art of mosaic. You've seen her murals and medallions at Radio City, Rockefeller Center, St. Patrick's Cathedral, St. Bartholomew's Church, Temple Emmanuel, One Wall Street, and, where I first became aware of her work, the AT&T Long Distance Building Lobby at 32 Avenue of the Americas. In that amazing ceiling mural, Meir's design depicted the continents linked by telephone wires and uses allegorical figures to convey the function of the Long Distance Building as a hub of international communication. Honestly, when I saw it, I thought Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. Let's bring Hildreth Meir out of obscurity and give her her rightful due. Here to help me are the President and Vice President of the International Hildreth Meir Association, Louise Meir Dunn and Hildreth Hilly Meir Dunn, the artist's daughter and granddaughter. They've been busy raising awareness about Meir's fantastic talent and promoting a beautiful new book about her, The Art Deco Murals of Hildreth Meir. I'm Alice Bloom. This is A Town and Village Two. <laughs> Welcome back. Louise, Hilly, thank you so much for being here. I am so honored because we met at actually the AT&T Long Distance Building two years ago at Open House New York. And it was the first time I had been in that building. And it's the first time I ever heard about Hildreth Mayer. Why don't we know more about her? Well, I think that actually architecture changed a lot hmm. after she died, and the new buildings didn't have space. They were sleek and glass and steel, and they didn't have room. For, and they didn't need the narrative work that my mother did. I guess that's so now, but she did so much Art Deco work, so that would have been in the 30s, probably. Yes, yes. And we treasure our Radio City Music, Music Hall, Hall and Rockefeller <laughs> Center, and some of us go to Temple Emmanuel, and some people go to St. Bartholomew's Church, yes. and other places which we're going to talk about. Um, and we look at her work all the time, but we don't see it. People, when, <clears throat> during, during her lifetime, she was well known. She was in the newspaper all the time. And as a matter of fact, I said after the book came out, I said that she was in the Times very often, but never on the front page that I was aware of. However, when the book came out, there she was on the front page, at the bottom those things, I, there's a name for it, but there was a picture of one of the Radio City Music Hall plaques. plaques. And Hilly said that was very expensive because they took out the background. Oh. You know, they didn't show the bricks. What was the, there was a term you used. Yeah. But um, so, and then inside, it went at the bottom, they did a whole Art Deco thing. And the New York Times had, it was three pages, the bottom that told the story and, and the book. Okay, so she, she was not unknown while no, she was working. No, no. So she no. enjoyed a certain amount of status oh, and appreciation. Absolutely, absolutely. Because when reading the book, I know she worked a great deal with architects. Architects yes. usually get the credit right, yes. for designing a building. Yes. Um, but the mosaic artist seldom signs her yeah. work. Yeah. Except for Temple Emmanuel, okay. there is a plaque on the outside of the temple, and it has her name on With it. With an attribution to her. Yes. Thank heaven. Yes. Now, was she very unusual being a woman artist as well at that time? I think so. There were a few. Effie Fortune was one of them. I don't remember the names of the other people, but um, she, she, she got her start through um, Bertram Goodhue. She was given an introduction to him. And he, sa he said he'd been, he had his sculptor and he'd been looking for a painter for years. And she was only 34, I think it was, when he offered her the job of designing the dome, the National Academy of Sciences in Washington. And the, arch the people in Washington said, Never heard of Hildreth Meir, never heard of her. 
you haven't said good you? She's doing all the work at the Nebraska State Capitol. At the Nebraska State Capitol, they said, Hildreth Mier? Never heard of her. Haven't you heard? She's doing the dome at the National Academy of Sciences <laughs> in Washington. It's a little bit of a setup here. <laughs> and, and as my mother said, she began at the top. Those were her first big commissions. And from then on, the rest of the jobs came. You know what impressed me so much by reading the book, and I highly commend it to anybody who has the slightest interest in Art Deco or learning yes. more about Hildreth Meir, was her versatility. Now, in Nebraska, she did the murals that were a tribute to Native American Indians. Yes. Her subject matter was quite different in many of her other commissions. Yes. yes. What kind of research did she do? In Nebraska, she was very fortunate. Hartley Burr Alexander. Bertram Goodhue died. You have to go back. Bertram Goodhue died the day or two before the National Academy of Science was, uh, was dedicated. Hartley Burr Alexander was a historian. I don't know his, I can't remember his direct titles, but he shepherded my mother. And the paint, the mosaics in the Senate chamber, I mean, there were, there were four huge panels and one was of Indians. And my mother would send him sketches and he would send them back. And he would say, this doesn't look like fighting. And she had to redo sketch after sketch until finally he's the one who said, now you've got it, that's war. So he, she had a mentor. She, well, I was just about to say, that's a little bit of luck to have captured somebody who believes in you yeah. and nurtures you yes. and forwards you, yes. sponsors you, and yeah. encourages you he as well. He was an iconographer. Okay. Now, she suffered some rejections. She applied to various art schools, art programs. Yeah. Well, they turned her down for the American Academy in Rome, and she had wonderful introductions. And um, they finally said they really couldn't accommodate a woman. And then she wrote back and she said, well, I'll be the first one who's going to start a woman's thing at the, at the American Academy. And did she? No, because by then, when they finally took women, she was already, her career had taken off. So she never did have to go back for formal training. No. I mean, well, I mean, you know, she had studied in, in Florence, and she'd studied at the Art Students League in New York, and she studied, then the family moved to California, and she studied there for three years. That's when she was doing sketches and studies, Pavlova. There's a, stud, there's a sketch of hers in the, in the book signed by Pavlova. And Margaret Anglin, who was doing theater, theater there, uh, suggested that maybe she could have some work in New York. And so she came back in 1916 and designed sketches, studies for costumes for the Metropolitan Opera. Oh my gosh. That so, was her first job in New But York. her versatility is so amazing to me. Here she's designing costumes, she does painting, murals, and then she goes to mosaics, which is a very different technique. Yes. Oh. Um, now, when she did the mosaics, she didn't actually install no, them. No, 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 no. She designed. Okay. She designed, but she did go to the factory. She went to Italy in 1928 trying to find out how much it would cost to do the mosaics at Temple Emanuel. And the Italians could never come up with a price. <laughs> so she went to Germany to the Poole and Wagner company mosaic company and they were able to give her a price within a, a, a week or something. She spent a week at the factory to learn a little bit more about how, to, how the mosaic process was done so that she would be able to give them cartoons. That's the word cartoon, um, most of us think of funny paper, the right. funny papers, but cartoons are full-size studies for the mosaics for anything that she did right, big. Yeah. And so she came back and she produced cartoons not only for Temple Emanuel but also for St. Bartholomew's. Now these cartoons had to be immense. 
they were, were done on cartoon paper. I brown, was brown paper. Brown paper. Mm -hmm. Heavy brown paper. Heavy brown paper that are, I forget, was it, they four feet wide? They came in rolls, like, you know, wrapping paper sort of thing. Did she have a studio? She in had New a York? studio on 57th Street opposite the Art Students League, where she'd studied at one time, as her mother had done. And she, the easel was 17 feet by 25 feet. That's some easel. <laughs> That's quite an easel. Now, we're remembering this is before Google, before the internet, yes. before CAD, before any of the programs we take right. for granted, before yeah. the sketch pencil we have with our iPads and such. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. And she had a lantern uh, that was an enlarging machine. Mm -hmm. That she, she, everything started with small, very small sketches for everything she did. And then they got bigger. And then they were eventually put into this lantern that threw it up and enlarged it. I've seen some of these. And it's a very valuable tool to people who have to do enlarging photographs or any yeah. kind of sketches. Now, she was a very astute businesswoman. Yes. I remember in reading the book, she was asked at some point if she would like to uh, take control of the entire commission, in other yeah. words, the implementation yeah. of the mosaic. That was, and she was smart enough to say so, no. That was the first, her first job. That was the National Academy of Sciences. After that, she did. I mean, doing the, I remember, the windows at St. Bartholomew's, mm -hmm. for instance. And she had a lawyer who drew up all her contracts, who became a very good friend. Now, but she rejected doing the entire commission because she but, didn't want to become admired, it seems, in the details. Well, that was, that was her first one. Okay. That was, I think, probably that was only for the National Academy of Sciences. And after that, she oversaw the construction of her murals. Well, it depended, mm -hmm. yes. She I mean, I don't, I don't know that, you know, she did her work and then it was up to Poole and Wagner to put the mosaics up at One Wall Street. To all, yeah, all the craftsmen. The craftsmen. So, but they had to work with her. Was she an easy person to work with? I think that she felt that the craftsmen, she always said that she felt that the craftsmen who fabricated her work yeah. made it more beautiful than she had ever thought that okay. it would be. The impression I got from the book was that she was a person of great integrity yes. and that she appreciated all the work of those yes. who yes. enhanced her work and implemented her work. Exactly. I mean, she wasn't a taskmaster. No. She might have been exacting, but she had a motivation there, and it was no. not to disparage anybody, no. but to get the best product. But she, turned, she turned her cartoons and her sketches over to somebody who then fabricated them. Okay. So she saw this as collaborative. Yes, yes. Not, she wasn't a diva. No, 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 no. no. She, she had to work with the architect, yes. with the client, with the factory. Okay, a lot of movable a parts lot here. Of, yes, yes, for a lot of people. Okay. Now, she was probably not, didn't have a huge peer group. We mentioned before there were a few other women artists. Yeah. But she must have had a lot of support from her family. You said her mother was an artist. Yes. When she came to New York in 1924, in 1916, she wrote her mother two, three times a week, but five, six, ten pages. Long letters. Long letters. Not emails. Not emails. <laughs> or but texts or tweets. <laughs> it's, it was, it's wonderful because we have those archives. And uh, Kathy Brower, who wrote the book, was co-author of the book, wanted to know about one of her very first jobs, and I said, let me look at the letters. A friend of Hilly's transcribed those letters. The binder is this big. Oh, how wonderful that they were kept. They were kept, but she transcribed them and then did a synopsis, and I was able to look up Peck and see that first and able to read that they undid the car crates and were able to use the crates as a drafting table or something, but it was being able to pick up a little bit of information from the letters that were written in 1916, 17. Was there anything that really surprised you? No. Anything that you didn't know about your mom? Well, I just, I grew up around, around, I, I didn't, 
my mother had a studio and went to the studio every morning. And I really didn't, did not, I rarely, I rarely went to the studio on 57th Street. So that was, you know, she had her assistants, she had a secretary, she had somebody who, you know, made lunch and that sort of thing. Okay, so she knew how to delegate and yes, how to yes. be single-minded. In growing up, did she encourage you to be an artist as well? I went to a couple of things when I was small, and no, not really. You know, I, I was, as I say, I went to the King Coit School, whatever that was, and I remember playing in plays, and I remember playing with clay and that sort of thing, but um, I didn't. I, I took up drawing, painting, when my husband, he was in the Foreign Service, we were posted in Chile. And somebody down there, his wife was in church, was giving classes, and I, so I began to paint down there. Did you ever make that a profession? Not really a profession, but it led to my profession uh, when we came back to the States, and um, I was taking classes, and people were going into exhibits, but you had to frame, and I didn't like the way that, I became a picture framer. Now, that's an amazing, <laughs> I mean, it makes sense because artists need to have their work exhibited, but is that something unique? I mean, now we think of going to Michael's or... Well, I'm the, I'm the uh, person who puts the things at Michael's together. together. And when we've had the exhibits of my mother's work, I framed any of her studies. And I wrote a book on framing with Jerry Laird and we sold 39,000 copies, oh isn't bad for a do-it-yourself. <laughs> Not at all. But her book, she's also a certified picture framer. Okay. Yeah. And her book was used by many to study for the exam. Well, it makes such a big difference in how we perceive a work of art, how it's yeah. exhibited matters. I mean, we can walk past something, as uh, sometimes we do at the Whitney Museum. I remember Richard Tucker's first, you know, something, uh, thumbtack on the wall, and thinking, what? No. <laughs> you know, how do we relate to this? No. But um, when it's presented in a more professional way and enhances no. the no. piece of work, it makes a huge difference. Let's talk about the foundation, or the association yes. that you two have formed. When did you find that you needed to do that? You started it. <laughs> I started it. We have a mutual admiration society. I, I think it's wonderful that you work so well together. I think yeah. it was in 2000. I began... I began... 2003. 2003, yeah. that we founded the International Hildreth Nier Association. And what's your objective? It is to, <laughs> it is to perpetuate her, her legacy. Okay. So through conducting activities, through education, through preservation. Okay. Did you see um, dwindling of interest in her? Or we have a generation of people who don't know her. I no. think that might have been a motivator. Did you see many of her works destroyed or marginalized? The, the big one that I think of immediately is the, the fourth one at Radio City Music Hall that was over the... Um, RKO? The RKO. And that was 70 some odd feet long. And it's gone. And they took that building down. Mm -hmm. But they recreated it. And they, they ha only had the small study that I had sold at an, at a, 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 an exhibit of that study, that study of that, that plaque. The RKO plaque? The RKO plaque. And it's down in the bowels of the Rockefeller Center Rockefeller passageway. Center passageway. It was recreated. They had okay. a sculptor recreate okay. the RKO. Because at least you had the photographs with yes. the yeah. sketches yeah. of yeah. it. To but the it. Rockefellers had it recreated, and there's a plaque oh, explaining that it was recreated. Did you motivate them to do so? Well, I sold, I sold oh, the true. study. Yeah. And okay. uh, I was supposed to be notified, I never was, but it's there. Okay. And there's a plaque that says it's based on my mother's study. Now you've rescued some pieces that were in obscurity. Yes. This one you were telling me about at the Prudential Center. Tell me more about that. Yes. So the um, Prudential headquarters in Newark, New Jersey, my grandmother had designed three panels, and it was about Hercules coming through the Straits of Gibraltar, 
So there's the pillars of Africa and the pillars of, of Europe. And then the middle one was Hercules coming through the Straits of, of Gibraltar. So there were three individual panels. They had taken them down in the 80s, put them into storage. Well, fortunately, they Thank didn't goodness. discard them. Right. When we had our exhibit, um, which, all, was, which was back, when was the exhibit? 03 or, or 04. Early, yes. yeah. 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 Early 2000s. Yes. And um, when we had the exhibit, all of a sudden, it was like, we have these mosaics. What should we do with them? Prudential called. Prudential called and said, we have these mosaics. And these Hillary panels. said they called up and said, we want to give them to you. And I said, we can't take 12 feet by 15 feet. They or must say. weigh a ton. Oh. They, three, three tons. Oh. They each, each, each weigh three, three tons. Okay, just the know, middle pull one. up your little you know, Subaru. Yeah. And, yeah. You know. because, because they had been taken off the wall. Okay. So the wall came with it. Yeah. So they were put into storage. They were brought out. And uh, as you, you put them into storage? Or no, no, no. They, no. they, they, they were. They, Prudential they were. had them in okay. storage. Okay. So they at least acknowledged the value of these or that they what, need to when be they, preserved. Yeah. When the exhibit came out. Oh, my gosh. Because of the exhibit. They were like, oh, we have these panels. So the end result was one of them, the middle one, is at the Newark Museum. Okay which is right down the street. Did from, you donate it to the museum or no, they donated it? No, Prudential did. Okay. Yeah, Prudential owned these. Okay. So Prudential donated the middle one to the Newark Museum and the other two went to Harvard University's Center for Hellenic Studies. Oh, at least they're down the place where they're Washington. cherished. Yeah, down in Washington, D.C. Okay. So they had to be restored and were sent down. For, for the Newark Museum, it had to be cut in half to get it into the museum. Oh my gosh. Yep, the wall had to be taken down and then the mosaics placed into the wall and then they were able to, um, Tony Schiavo and Steve Miotto. Who are current artists working yes. in mosaics, yes. right? Right. They were able to restore them and then cut them in half. So they restored the panel, cut it in half, <laughs> put it up, got, in, got installed back and then Sealed it, Seal, all up. sealed it up. Now, was this done at your inspiration, or did the Newark Museum say, "Oh, we're going to do, we're going to take care of it. Don't yeah. worry about it." No, actually, Kathy Brower helped. Kathy wrote us, the book. Kathy the, wrote the book, book and okay. she wrote letters to different museums. Okay. And but, it's and we all I, over all over the country. I mean, we looked for places all over the country. How many pieces are there in existence? Do you have any idea? No. No, I've never counted it. No. You know how many commissions are still. Are out there. We'll have to. Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, we yeah. have the that uh, national brochure, and it shows you where you can go to visit. Okay. One of my favorite sites is One Wall Street, which uh -huh. is going to be reopened very soon. Right. If we've got a photo, let's we're going to try to bring that up. It is one of the most spectacular oh, rooms yes. I have ever seen. I mean, it just takes your breath away. But I never would have thought that an artist designed it. I mean, it's what do they call it? The Red Room? Yeah, the Red Room. Red right. Room. And it was designed for Irving Trust. Yes, yes. Um, now it's going to be reopened. Yep. Is that they, correct? They've but, cleaned it. Okay. It's been cleaned. And when do they expect to reopen it? We're waiting to hear. Okay. <laughs> they're almost done. Okay. And we're waiting to hear what they're going to be doing with the room. How would people find out more about places to see Hildreth Mayer's work? Oh, on our website. Okay. So www.hildreth, H-I-L-D-R-E-T-H, M-E-I-E-R-E, -E -E okay. dot com. Okay. And we're in the middle of redoing the website. Okay. But if people want to know where they can see her they work. They go right to our website, and there's a tab. Okay. It says, you know, commission, commission by state, and they just click through. Wonderful. Now, yeah. you have some upcoming events. Some of them have dates. We know that <laughs> Open House New, New York, York is this wonderful event. If, if mm -hmm. our viewers don't know about it, please Google it. Um, it's the second week in October, I think. Right, October 14th and 15th. 15th. When sites throughout New York City are open to the public. Okay. And that's where I met you two at the AT&T Long Distance Building. Um, if we've got a photo of that, we'll bring it up. Um, because you were there to raise awareness about these yes. fabulous murals that we were looking at and the ceiling. Last year, I graded f over 400 people. 
in one day. In one, and you do a great job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the year before, they'd had a thousand people. Yeah, Five hundred people each day. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And now that's a building I've probably been in, but never looked up. You know, it's a lot. You're going yeah. to work, or you're going to you know meeting or something. You don't look up. But when I say it reminded me of the Sistine Chapel, I am not exaggerating. Yeah. Of course, all of these um, historical allegorical figures are connected by telephone wires yes. <laughs> because the objective. Yes. Now that was a story where Hilda's first design was rejected. Yes. Oh yes. And she just persisted, and she redesigned, redesigned to accommodate she, her she client. She wanted to do the life. At that time, there were five thousand women who used that. For te they were telephone operators. Yes. And you think of Lily Tomlin, this yes, is the telephone yes, operator, right? Exactly. And um, she did the, you know, a, a day in the life of a telephone operator. Mm -hmm. And they did not want that. So they have the four, con four continents. And last year, they, somebody, Open House New York, had a little boy. And I said, why don't you go find the kangaroo? <laughs> You know, because there's it, there is one, yes. there's one up there for Australia. Oh, it's amazing! I urge everyone to look at the sites. We haven't very much time left. There are a couple of other events coming up. The Landmarks Conservancy, the, is the New planning. York Landmarks Conservancy, is going to plan a mere month. Oh my gosh! When will that be? Any idea? It, it will. It all depends about when when Wall Street opens up. Okay, so sometime in 2018, I would expect. And yes. we're taping now right. in September of 2017. Okay, well, we're going to be watching for that. Right. Um, Louise, you always like, you've given lots of talks throughout yes. the nation about your mom. And you always like to conclude with a paragraph or so that you read, and it's yes. very affecting. Will you read that for yes. us now? This is a letter from Hildreth to a friend in 1952. From 1922 on, I have been just as busy as I could be on jobs of all sorts, for churches and bars, for world's fairs and ships, and for big buildings, both public and commercial. I have painted or designed for many mediums, mosaic, marble, glass, metal, gesso relief, wood, ceramic, and even tile. It has meant hard work, long, long hours over a drawing board or before a big easel, or climbing up ladders or on scaffoldings. It has meant being businesslike and reliable and always finishing things on time, being tactful and untemperamental in running a big studio and dealing with architects, clients, and assistants. In fact, it has been anything but the sort of artist's life I probably dreamed of. Of course, I have loved doing it all the more than anything else. That's lovely. Thank you so much, Louise. Hilly, thank you so much for telling us about Hildreth Mayer, and I hope that our viewing audience pursues more information about her. She has really enhanced our life. Thank you for being my guest. I look forward to seeing you in the future, certainly at the Landmarks Conservancy, <laughs> if not at Open House New York. And thank to our you. viewers at home, thank you so much for watching. I'm Alice Bloom, and we'll see you next time.